Welcome to Code Together, a podcast for developers by developers, where we discuss technology and trends in industry. I'm your host, Tony Monkolsmeyer. As AI applications have become more prevalent, one of the biggest challenges is efficiently and cost-effectively deploying your AI solution. For some, it's as simple as following whatever pricing model a backend API SaaS from Google or OpenAI charges. But for others who are looking to deploy their own solutions, this can be very challenging. Today, we talk to Mihai Marakutsa, whose company NodeShift is looking to bring that total cost of deployment down. Mihai is an Oxford University data science alumni with a professional background from Microsoft Azure, Twitter, or X, Epic Games, and Cisco. He co-founded NodeShift two years ago with Andre Surkov. Welcome to the podcast, Mihai. Yeah, and great to be speaking to you, Tony, and thank you so much for having me on board. Really appreciate it. Yeah, and so I'm really excited for this one because I know uh, in your bio that you originally sent me, you mentioned that you had written a lot of papers around cloud-native uh, deployment and design, which is right up my alley. So this will be a good one. But first, let's start with what is NodeShift? Sure. So I'll start from a, from a, from a really high-level perspective. It's worth noting that I used to be a in the cloud space before Microsoft Azure, Cisco Systems, and actually that's how I got to meet my co-founder as well um, from our Cisco background. And I always feel like when I initially started my career, my main goal was always to make sure that we generate as much revenue as possible, which means that we offer cloud at very high prices. And I feel like NodeShift is my way of cleansing that scene and providing affordable cloud services. So what exactly is NodeShift? We're essentially a cloud platform that aggregates multiple independent data centers across the globe. And we're talking about enterprise grade data centers with 99.99 uptime service level agreements, SOC 2 certifications, ISO 27001, in most cases certified by the Uptime Institute as well. We take their spare capacity and we aggregate them under the hood of our platform, uh, which is no chip itself. Why would anyone use us to begin with? Well, the prices on average are 70 to 80% cheaper compared to the big traditional cloud providers like AWS, Google Cloud, Microsoft Azure. But also we have a large geographical coverage of data centers all across the globe. So we're talking about hundreds of data centers all across North America, South America, Europe, Asia, Africa, Australia, you name it, we probably have coverage there. And that's uh, no chip in a nutshell. Yeah, and I, you mentioned cost. And I, I think when we talk about cost, you know, we're not talking about like five or ten percent. You're you're actually when I'm looking at your website right now, uh, we're talking like exponential amounts of cost, right? Like ten order on the order of like ten x or something like that. In some cases, exactly, exactly. So this is where what's important noting this is this is not even just about cost optimization. It's about cost reduction. You literally take the same workload that you could have in your traditional cloud provider. Um, or even a more affordable cloud provider, you take the same workload, you move it with us, and you'll see cost differences straight away. Because what happens with a traditional big provider, like let's say, for example, AWS, if you look at their public financial statements, you'll see that AWS represents 13% of Amazon's revenue at over 73% of its profitability, which means the markup margins are really high. What happens here is that we get the spare capacity that data centers can't sell themselves. We already get that at a more affordable rate, plus including the fact that we don't charge outrageously high margins and you get a very affordable cloud platform whilst providing that enterprise grade infrastructure. Yeah. And, and you also have a variety of offerings. So I noticed that you had like different levels of GPU offerings, et cetera. Um, and I assume that uh, maybe that's a bad assumption, which is uh, how do you, I guess the question is, how do you tie the performance trade-offs, the latency trade-offs, et cetera, with the cost? Because like as, if I'm a developer and I'm looking to convince, for instance, my management to deploy somewhere, they're going to ask me that question. Like, well, is the latency going to be as good? Yeah, it's cheaper, but what's the performance going to be like? Sure. And b before diving into the latency bit, I'll just outline for a second what exactly you can get through the platform. So we're talking about currently infrastructure service layer. So compute virtual machines, GPU powered virtual machines, as well as storage. When I say storage, we're talking about both object storage, which is S3 bucket equivalent, as well as block storage as well. And also you have on top um, additional functionality surrounding that infrastructure service layer. Actually, from the latency perspective, this is where we stand out because 
we have such a wide coverage of data centers all across the globe, we can actually be much closer to your end customer, whether it's another business or a B2C segment, we can actually find a data center for you that is very, very close to you know, the location of that customer. So we can actually decrease latency to begin with. Um, a clear example of that, we just onboarded a customer that is based out of South America, but is using DigitalOcean as a cloud provider. DigitalOcean as a cloud provider currently only has data centers in North America as the closest point to uh, to South America. So we have data centers over in Bogota in Colombia, over in Sao Paulo in Brazil. So they were able to decrease their latency by something along the lines of 40 to 50 MS. So we're talking about very big um, differences. What's the trade-off that you get here? Um, getting back to the ultimate point, and sorry for 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 for, for this long long monologue. Um, this is exactly why we built this to begin with. There's no trade-offs here within the hardware perspective. The the only trade-off is currently from a platform-based perspective. We're a new cloud platform. We haven't built that deep functionality that you would get in Microsoft Azure or AWS. We don't have that platform as a service layer just yet. But that's exactly where we're heading. We built the fundamental level of infrastructure service, and we're moving over to pass. So yes, you won't have the equivalent of Lambda functions. You won't get uh, the equivalent of managed Kubernetes, but that's coming. Like, you know, towards the end of the summer, we'll have a managed Kubernetes offering as well. So we are playing catch up as well, that on top of quality hardware, you would also have uh, quality services too. Okay, and when you mentioned kind of the co-location, um, the first thing I think about is data movement and so like if I if I pick a location, am I pinned to that location? Is that something that moves depending on who my customer is? I guess that's probably something that I would negotiate with NodeShift. And then also, I think you and I talked about this a little bit before um, in a pre-meeting where we talked about data residency. I think that was a, a really good point. I actually hadn't thought about it, but where your data lives really affects how your data needs to be regulated. So talk a little bit about that because I think that's a really interesting topic right now. But in all honesty, when we started this as well, we, we didn't realize how much of an impact data residency would play as well and geographical coverage in general. When we started NodeShift, the main value we saw is that how much spare capacity is out there across the world and how affordable it is and how we can make it easily accessible for the rest of the world. So data residency was, 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 was what became pretty much for us a primary topic, not only of discussion, but development of a product as a whole. So what do we mean here is, if you look at the majority of countries across the world, they do have some sort of regulations on board, which basically state that, you know, for the purpose of processing data of local citizens, the data cannot leave, you know, the premises of that country. Even if you take European Union with GDPR, if you look at specific countries within the European Union, like Germany, the data of German citizens cannot leave the premises of Germany itself. So it's even stricter than GDPR as a whole. So when we were designing NodeShift, one of the core ideas was we should not only be compliant with regulations like GDPR in Europe or CCPA in California, which is the GDPR's equivalent over in the US, but we should also be compliant with the fact that if you deploy your data or virtual machines in one particular region, it should stay there unless you explicitly state that you want the data to travel elsewhere. So the system was designed in such a way that it's you know, compliant from, from, from the ground up where you deploy something in a one particular data center, you can do it through the self-serve platform or you can do it through our sales team and your data is gonna stay there unless you intentionally want to replicate it for you know, backup reasons elsewhere. Okay, and you mentioned self-serve platform. So a little bit when you were talking about deployment and, and you did mention things that you don't have yet, but one of the big things that you do have um, is this self-service platform, it sounds like. So can you detail what capabilities do I get as somebody who's looking to deploy? I've come to you now and said, I, I have something I need to deploy. What capabilities can I currently get out of NodeShift? Sure. So you straight away, when you go into the self-serve platform, you have access to deployment of compute virtual machines and GPU virtual machines, where you can deploy resources all across the globe. So if I focus on compute specifically, you can choose the flavor of the operating system, any, any Linux-based uh, virtual machine, you can essentially set up on that. It goes down to the level of hardware as well. Like, you know, we have everything from Intel Xeon chips to anything else you might you, you, you might think about. You basically set up your SSH key and deploy a virtual machine 
for compute you pay uh, per per hour, for GPUs you pay per minute, for storage you pay per terabyte. So again, it's a consumption-based pricing model where you pay only for what you use. When it comes to GPU virtual machines, we have a wide array of GPUs. Anything you might think of, we have available. So anything from you know AI ML training GPUs like NVIDIA A100s, H100s, we've got them, uh, all the way to retail grade gaming GPUs like the NVIDIA RTXs. However, worth noting as well is that we're also uh, currently jumping into tests uh, with uh, Intel's Gaudi chips as well, um, as we have two customers that are interested in benchmarking their performance against the NVIDIA ones. And we have data center providers across the globe that would be able to, to offer us that data center capacity. And last but not least important, compute and GPUs are great, but you always need to attach some storage to it. Uh, you need to some data to do processing on top of. So block storage and object storage is essentially that perfect tooling that allows you to mount data on top of your virtual machines or not data storage on top of your virtual machines to be able to tap into it. Most importantly, it's all tied very nicely together through a role-based access control system. So if you're an organization, you can set up multiple entities, projects, roles, so you can manage it like you would any other enterprise-grade project. So it's already very easily usable by bigger enterprises as well because of that role-based access functionality that really drills down into each individual um, access right within the platform. Uh, thinking about storage, and I guess maybe I'm a little obsessed with data movement just because it's how big <laughs> things in AI are now today. Um, with each data center, are, are there particular requirements that you have with data centers before you partner with them in terms of like the storage performance? Obviously, the compute hardware is the compute hardware, and, that, and that's pretty straightforward when you select it. But like storage performance can vary greatly depending on what my network infrastructure looks like per data center. Um, do you guys have requirements like that, or do you just expose that to your customers when they're choosing where they want to deploy? Sure. Um, this is an excellent question. Well, first of all, the way we look at it is from a regulatory perspective. We try to make sure that even, even before we, we dive into the hardware for, for storage and bandwidth speed, we're looking at things like, okay, was there an entity that certified the data center capacity, which we're talking about things like Optime Institute, which is literally an entity that would visit the data center, would look like, you know, what it looks like, what, what, what are the uptime service level agreements the data center can provide. And usually they classify data centers from tier one to tier four. Um, ironically enough, tier one being the worst one, tier four being the best one. So we tried to select the tier four ones, which basically means you have a minimum of four nines when it comes to uptime service level agreements. Now that we've ironed out the, the regulatory part, just like you mentioned, when it comes to storage, we want to uh, we, we want to understand, you know, do we have any limitations of inputs, outputs per second? Do we have any limitations in, in terms of latency? Uh, what is the maximum bandwidth speed that we can get? Because let's say, for example, we get a customer that wants to move a few petabytes of data. Suddenly it becomes problematic because it all depends on the uh, on the channel speed. So we try to get infrastructure that can actually be very easily used by our customer by providing you know high bandwidth speeds when it comes to uh, the internet itself um, high inputs outputs per second as well um, and then we kind of have a threshold internally that we identified as a minimum and that kind of fluctuates up and above because we at first anticipated that only high level certain high level only high quality infrastructure would be needed but we actually um had a few customer requests recently where you know they're they don't really care about the type of infrastructure and even even when it comes to storage all they care about can they get it for affordable rate and they just want to dump a lot of data there just to host it for regulatory reasons and maybe they will look there once every few years interesting yeah, that's super interesting and um, I know that you you mentioned to me that you guys were going to be spinning up virtual private cloud. Um, could you talk a little bit about that and explain what that means for your customers? Sure, and we're, we're extremely excited about this because this is a new feature that we're planning to launch um, towards um, early uh, to mid June. Actually, you can create your virtual machines, but you do need a secure enclave for, for them to, 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 to run inside. So virtual private cloud functionality will essentially allow you to create a virtual network where you can you know pull all of your virtual machines across different data centers all into this vir virtual network, essentially, um, where you know outsiders or virtual machines from the outside won't be able to, to connect into it. It's really beautiful because it not only will allow you to protect your virtual machines across multiple different data centers, but it creates the seamless experience where despite the fact that actually under the hood, 
you're working across different physical locations with different business entities, with different physical data centers. From your perspective as a customer, you don't see any of that. All you see is you create a few virtual machines here, there, and here, and then you pull them into this virtual private cloud, and it feels to you as if you know they're running within the same data centers um, uh, with one actual phys phys physical network. And again, what we'll also do as an add-on to our virtual private cloud functionality is find automatically data centers for you with the lowest latency between them. So when you create that VPC, uh, virtual private cloud, sorry, um, the latency is going to be very small because we'll intentionally choose data centers that relatively um, have the, the the best connection speeds. Even in situations where like you want to put your New York, New Jersey data center in the same virtual private cloud as your Amsterdam one, we'll find you know a data centers with the Netherlands and Amsterdam that actually has the quickest uh, bandwidth speed as well. And and you'll be deciding by based on performance and based on pricing what option works for you. And you decide what the trade offs are. Do you want to go for a higher price? and better network, or do we want to go for a lower price, lower network uh, speed? Cool. Yeah, no, that sounds pretty amazing. Is that going to be available in a self-serve manner, or is that something <clears throat> where you're going to have to... Oh, so self-serve even for that. Self-serve, yeah. So this is a, 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 a very huge, huge achievement from, from our perspective. Like, you know, we're very excited uh, about it. We've worked on it for a long time. And this is going to be a game changer for a lot of enterprise customers because until now the the main usage of our platform was okay you can spin up like you know multiple databases or independent software within the virtual machines but a lot of the more complex applications within enterprises that do require that networking functionality and this finally suddenly like you know opens the doors for all of that because you can deploy your gpu virtual machines your cpu virtual machines Put them all into 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 one network and you know create a seamless and, and a swift and secure communication. Nice, <clears throat> yeah, that's cool. That's actually really impressive. The the engineering that goes into front end, back end connections like that is always challenging. So good job. Um, you also have partnered with a variety of Intel groups uh, programs, I guess we'd say. So I I didn't actually even know that you were partnered with Ignite, but so you partnered with it looks like with Intel Ignite. Intel Liftoff for startups, um, and also the Intel Tiber Developer Cloud. Um, and obviously, being an Intel podcast, I'd love to talk about all of those things. Um, I guess let's start off with Intel Liftoff. So Intel Liftoff is kind of one of our engineering programs for our, our startups that we that we work with. Can you talk a little bit about how Intel Liftoff has helped you? Yeah, sure. So from the Intel Liftoff perspective, the biggest support that we've received is actually getting our hands on tangible hardware infrastructure that we otherwise wouldn't be able to. Uh, yes, we do have data center partners that whose infrastructure we sell, but the benefit that we have of working with the Intel Liftoff program is that when we had customers come ask for a particular type of hardware setup, like let's say, for example, it's a less orthodox you know, ratio of uh, CPUs to RAM to storage, and you really need someone within the data center to come and connect and like you know, and allow us to experiment with the hardware. Um, Intel Liftoff was 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 great from that experience. You know, leveraging the, the data center over in Arizona and actually getting that custom setup for us. You know, that unusual request, so we could essentially be able to 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 test that infrastructure um, and see what it would look like, and then that essentially sped up the the development process because now we understand what are the flaws of our platform. How can we create a more seamless experience when, when it comes to connecting bare metal and more unusual bare metal configurations? And this essentially allowed us to develop new functionality when it comes to connecting new data center partners with their bare metal. So we're talking about very tangible outputs, nothing like symbolical of like, they are webinars and stuff like this, of course, but the value is actually in this very hands-on approach where people proactively ask you, okay, how can we help you? What can we do? Can we try something new? And in addition to this, just like you mentioned, just like the opportunity with this podcast, Intel has been inviting us to join speaking sessions, um, actual sp sponsorship opportunities where they would sponsor an event and they would invite us over as well um, just to have present. And um, again, this would open an opportunity to actually meeting new customers as well, where otherwise we as a startup wouldn't be able to get our foot in the door. But suddenly, as a result of that, um, Intel Liftoff branding and connections, particularly Ralph, who's, who's running the program, has been extremely supportive in opening new doors for us. Yeah, like I mentioned, you, you also have partnered with Ignite and the Intel Tiber Developer Cloud. Can you talk a little bit about how that has been helpful um, for you guys as a startup? Sure. So Intel Ignite has been 
pretty much the the booster that launched us uh, pr pretty aggressively moving forward. Um, and just just for reference, Intel Ignite is a program for deep tech startups. I mean, to be fair, before that, we didn't realize we were a deep tech startup to begin with. Um, <laughs> but um, yeah, it's it's a program for deep tech startups in a more advanced stage, usually late seed, Series A startups, and essentially supports them by you know bringing on experts to essentially guide you into you know fundraising, public speaking, um, product development, uh, uh, technical debugging, um, new connections, new customers. You, we were, at the time when we got in, we were at a pre-seed stage. So we just raised our first um, half a million back then. We didn't qualify for the Intel Ignite program, but we were recommended by one of the investors um, they didn't invest in us at the time, but they said, hey, I think we'd be a, 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 a suitable startup for the program. They made an exception for us because they, they, they found really maybe the team interesting or the product interesting. So we got in and that was just a huge learning curve for us. First of all, because we were surrounded by a lot of experienced startup founders that have gone through everything we were about to go through that provided us with very tangible advice, but also because we were able to tap into a lot of that Intel expertise, um, starting from technical support, um, guidance on pricing, as well as business positioning, um, you know, deep focus as well from investment perspective of how we should build our fundraise process. As a result of that, when we actually started fundraising, um, as a result of Intel's help initially uh, for, from a stra strategy and guiding perspective, we were able to get the initial offers within two weeks of us kickstarting the fundraising process, which, again, last year during a horrible economic outlook was you know, very, very quick and seamless. So Intel Ignite has been tremendous support for us, and we actually still very closely in touch uh, with them. Wow, that's that's amazing. And then lastly, of course, the Intel Tiber Developer Cloud, I, I know that you mentioned uh, Gaudis. So I'm assuming that you're trying to use the Gaudis within the Intel Tiber Developer, Developer Cloud to help you prototype and understand the characteristics and then hopefully pass that on to your users. Yeah, because the, 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 the Intel Gaudi chips and NVIDIA CUDA compatible. So we have customers that are essentially interested in benchmarking the performance um, against H100s. And for, from their perspective, not just from their perspective, to be fair, with every customer that we speak to, especially if they're in the AI machine learning space, all they care about is how they can perform their training operations, AI ML training, but then inference running as well at the most affordable rate and how they can reduce their costs. Um, money is getting expensive even during this economy. So even even the AI ML startups that are receiving like you know tens of millions of funding, they're still trying to be relatively cost conscious. So from our perspective, this benchmarking exercise is going to allow us to compare the the performance, see if they're happy with the way things operate, because we can get those chips for them at a much uh, cheaper rate on a per hour rent basis compared to what they get with H100s. So we're currently in the preparation stages of, of getting that set up. All right, so I'm gonna shift gears a little bit. So I think we, we've dove into Node Shift a lot. Um, it sounds like a really exciting product. I, I'm glad that we were able to dive in enough because you know it's, it's always hard to, to dig through websites and figure out what's going on. So thank you for all of that. I'm gonna shift now to what I like to do with pretty much all of the founders, co-founders that I talk to, which is to have some discussion about those challenges of actually starting a company. And you've mentioned Ignite and some of the challenges you had there. So I'll, I'll just skip to this. As a co-founder, who's pretty far along the process, I mean, I guess a couple of years doesn't sound like a long time, but when you're moving at the speed of a startup, it's a very long time because you've got to survive in advance, essentially, um, like we like to say, right, when we watch uh, the NCAA tournament basketball in the US. What is the biggest challenge that you currently face today what is the hardest part of your job being a co-founder at node shift Ooh, that's an interesting one i think the challenge changes almost on a daily basis the things that maybe i sweat or cried about yesterday will be drastically different from the ones today which makes it fun as well but realistically if, if i were to put it into broader categories i'd say it's three segments that always concern me and my co-founder as well one is people in an HR perspective, managing different types of personalities, talents as well, trying to keep everyone happy and making sure that everyone is focused and streamlined. That sounds like a 
very basic thing, especially since I come from a traditional enterprise background. To me, it seemed like, hey, like, you know, in large enterprises, everything works so smoothly and it's so organized up until you start, you know, kind of dwelling deeper into your own kitchen and you realize how, how complex it is, like, you know, um, you know, finding the right talent, making sure that everyone's happy and satisfied. Second category, I would say from a technological perspective, you're never developing things fast enough. Even when we're scaling the engineering team, like, you know, you, you make certain plans, uh, you've designed the roadmap t to perfection, giving buffer time as well. So many things can go wrong, right? Um, and we had certain features that were meant to come out earlier that were delayed for, for about a few weeks. Um, and then that, in, in essence, delayed the roadmap by a while as well. So again, that, you know, can very easily keep you up at, um, at, 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 at night as well. Um, and then the last aspect is from a customer perspective as well. It's basically you trying to make sure that everyone is satisfied, uh, tailoring your product to multiple use cases, but also having to make a decision where, yes, you might have a bigger customer that's willing to, to pay a lot, um, but that would, in essence, sacrifice the roadmap that you're trying to do and maybe derail it from the features that other smaller customers would ask. And you have to make a strategic strategic decision almost, like, you know, in which in which the trajectory or direction you're planning to, to, to develop your product. So it might not sound too stressful or concerning, but when you put an interchange then between each other and different problems, you know, um, turn around, like, you know, it, it becomes stressful, but I'm very lucky enough that my co-founder and I have known each other for a long time. And we were able to to battle through it quite successfully. And we do have quite supportive investors who have been extremely helpful for us throughout this whole process and trying to figure things out. That's awesome. All right. And so I'll pivot one more time um, to just general technology. So I find that the, the people who found companies spend a lot of time thinking about their solutions and why their solutions are important to whatever industry they're in. Um, we are currently in this age of AI and compute explosion. I mean, we probably thought that 10 or 15 years ago, but now we're really here and maybe, maybe it'll continue to grow. We'll see. But what interests you the most in technology today outside of the area you're in? What are you looking forward to, to the future that you think is going to change the technology industry? Yeah, no, no, no. I, lo I love the question as well, because we, we, we briefly chatted about this earlier. And ironically enough, even though I read a lot about everything that's happening in the AI space, like everyone does and everyone tracks and try out every every new tool and every new star startup that comes out, whether they're raw or like, you know, with more uh, polished products, um, I'm actually much more interested in anything to do with space exploration because I feel like it's like a, such mm. a fascinating field. Um, and, you know, having having people on different planets and hopefully maybe even outside our solar system at some point just sounds like extremely, extremely exciting. And it's almost, you know, uh, saddening that, you know, we were born too late to uh, to explore Earth to its full potential and cover new places. I mean, you can still do it, but you won't discover anything particularly new, but too late, you know, to do proper space exploration. So I find that the part, I don't know, extremely exciting. So anything to do from governmental programs when it comes to space exploration all the way to, to private companies. Um, I love the fact that we have billionaires like Elon Musk and Jeff Bezos trying to, to battle it out and other people coming through like Richard Branson, then like completely failing, you know, going bankrupt, but it's exciting. It's like, it's so cool. Yeah, I guess that that is true. Cause like, I think with, uh, with what we deal with, with computers and technology, even though there's this exponential growth that kind of has shot up, it's still kind of a well-known problem in the sense of technologically, we know what the next stages of possibilities should be. Um, obviously there's new algorithms, there's breakthroughs and things like that, but with space, there is the true unknown. Um, I will say though, I, now we're like totally diverging from this. So I hope our audience is okay with this. Like, you know, like the oceans, there's tons of stuff within the oceans. We don't understand the inside of the earth. I think in terms of that, there's a lot of opportunities there. Uh, so you know, that, and, and I live in Orlando, so I get to see a rocket launch probably once every two weeks if I really want to. There was one yesterday. I just looked out my window because it popped up on my phone and I could just see the, the rocket shooting off. Yeah, it was really cool. I feel like tech is almost lagging behind and anything to do with 
archaeological excavations. Uh, I know there's like, you know, dating technology that still allows you to do a lot of things and figure a lot of things out, but I almost feel like, obviously, because there's no profits involved in it, anything to do with researching Earth and researching history from an archaeological perspective, from a tech perspective, lags behind. And that's, and that's another interesting field that I think, like, you know, when it, w- once you have someone uh, crazy with a lot of money that just thrown at it, I think there's going to be a lot of interesting tech coming out that way. So... To try to bring it back a little bit, I, I, we could talk about that probably for hours because it's super interesting. Are there things that you think that I'll say democratizing um, compute will help in the spaces that we're talking about? So we're talking about kind of physical engineering challenges, but we are, you as a company are, are helping with this democratization of large scale compute. Are there places where you feel like the technology that you're bringing will help solve some of the problems in those other spaces? Yeah, sure. sure. So just just to provide some context as well, um, we, we've talked about it earlier. I've, I've, I've re- written a lot of um, research during my university on the topic of democratizing access to cloud infrastructure. Back then when I was writing about it, it was more of an abstract concept about how you have very talent, talented developers, let's say South America, Southeast Asia, Asia in general, um, Africa as well, um, that have already access to high quality internet, they have access to, uh, to to computers, good programmers, but they don't have access to proper good infrastructure to be launching more complex applications, which means that, you know, you, you have this lost Einstein's like, you know, that never able to develop like, you know, some very fascinating technology companies because of the fact that they can't afford that infrastructure. And what do we do with with node shift and that's why the self serve platform is available as well for for everyone very easily to sign up is that for literally starting with like five dollars a month you can rent like you know a virtual machine for uh, for for your application and just like seamlessly and easily run it in any location if latency matters you can find a data center that is close to you and run it and what we see if we take away any of the practical use cases for more traditional businesses or or verticals what we truly Envision is that over time, once we grow in terms of product-led growth and actual have actual customers um, hear about us, is we'll see a lot more developers from developing countries start using us and maybe even build out successful businesses on top of it, because the starting capital is so low that even in a in a in a in a in a, in a much poorer country, you'll be able to uh, to kickstart that. And I'm from Eastern Europe myself, from Moldova, which is used to be the poorest country now is the second poorest country in Europe um, and again like if, if, if I had a project like this to be able to run infrastructure at affordable rate that would be a massive game changer but if we're talking about particular impact on industry that affordability can drive and democratizing access it's also gaming you know on top of our GPUs given their distribution we're actually waiting and looking forward to onboarding cloud gaming companies where somebody would build a cloud gaming product on top where you know a person that doesn't have access to like a full-on gaming computer because they're quite pricey will be able to rent a gpu from us for a very affordable rate and just basically run and play games wherever they are okay well that that is interesting um and i i think that the reason why I, i framed that question that way was um i actually just had a podcast talking to somebody who's working on the aurora supercomputer right, that Intel's hardware went into in Chicago. And that they love, rightfully so, to talk about all the science that you're going to be able to do on these gigantic supercomputers that they're standing up. And, and it popped into my head that it'd be really nice to be able to do some of that science as well, where you don't have access to that supercomputer, because it does require a lot of effort, you know, even though they have programs for, uh, to be able to run your application for free on that infrastructure, it's not always going to be available or accessible. So it did seem like the the type of work that you're doing, being able to lower the cost by orders of magnitude potentially, really might help bring up a more broad base of applications and scientists to help them make progress when they can't get onto the gigantic systems that we have, you know, around the world. So I think that that's a, a really positive thing here that you guys are bringing to the table, which businesses, you know, and developers who are listening may not care, but hopefully it does matter to to the rest of the world. Yeah, and again, when when you're developing, we're a B two B product. We know we're developing our cloud platform for other enterprises in, because that's 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 where it's possible to scale the most. 
Um, however, one of the investors that we have on board is actually Oxford University's investment arm. Uh, and one of the aspects that they found interesting is that we have a very seamless experience to deploy GPUs and run Jupyter notebooks for them, which a lot of people in academia, even if you're a non-technical, non-data science person, you can actually spin up very easily a Jupyter notebook in order to like, you know, run some statistical analysis, even within social sciences or more precise sciences. And again, you can do it at a very affordable rate in a very seamless way. Yeah, absolutely. All right. So Mihai Marikutsa, thank you for joining us. Yeah, thank, thank you so much for your time, Tony. Really appreciate it. All right. And thank you, our listeners who are watching on YouTube or listening on Apple Music, Spotify. Um, and we'll see you next time when we talk more technology and trends in industry. Thank you.